I'm Lawrence Datnoff. I'm currently the uh, department head for plant pathology and crop physiology at LSU and the LSU Ag Center. And um, there's about 14 faculty members that uh, I collaborate with on a number of variety of topics. Uh, some of this has to do with mineral nutrition and plant diseases, and some of this has to do with silicon. So the benefits of silicon, especially in plants, is it seems to alleviate stresses, whether they're biotic or abiotic. So I've studied the biotic against a number of what we call host pathogen systems, where you know you have the pathogen, and it can either be the host plant's rice, or it could be turf, or it could be an ornamental. And um, so we've seen that, um, for example, in rice, it reduces the uh, components of host plant resistance. And that's a way to measure uh, the development of the pathogen on the plant. So we talk about uh, you know number of lesions, lesion size, uh, the rate of lesion expansion, the number of spores that could be produced in that lesion. Like with rice, it reduces all of those. So we know there's something going on inside the plant. And we've seen that in other systems like in turf. So then if you start looking at the plant, we see that there's a number uh, defense responses like phenolics are produced. We get these uh, phytolexin compounds, they're low molecular weight compounds that have uh, antimicrobial activity. Uh, PR proteins, pathogenesis related proteins, there's about 16 of those that have been identified so far and a number of those are present so they have antimicrobial activity also. Uh, peroxidases are uh, upregulated and so peroxidases are important in lignin production and lignin is what fortifies cell walls uh, for an example. So then if you look at okay what genes are up and down regulated within like a 24-hour period you see there's a cascade of uh, defense and metabolic genes upregulated and downregulated. I mean right away in a plant like rice without being challenged by a pathogen. So it has to be a priming effect. The plant is primed and ready to go with silicon. If you don't have it there, it won't be primed and ready to go. Okay, because it's xylotranslocated. So once it goes into the leaf, uh, the first leaf, it uh, polymerizes. So it's no longer available to any other leaf. So it has to be constantly fed to the plant moving through the xylem as the plant's growing to get the full effects of the element. There's some benefits to soils, like for an example, it helps to um, reduce manganese toxicity. Uh, whether it's a soil, again, a soil application is affecting that with a, uh, something going on in the interaction with manganese or better assimilation distribution of the plant so it doesn't accumulate where it's toxic. Same thing with phosphorus, it's been shown in low phosphate soils, you can enhance the accumulation of uh, phosphorus. I think most people who study uh, soil science, they've been taught that silicon is the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust. So most soils have plenty of silicon, right? But that's not really the case. There's many soils that are lower limiting in that element. Even though it, it's there, it's not available to the plant at the quantities it needs to perform like it needs to perform, especially against something like a bi biotic stress. You know, the research, for example, that I was doing, I, I looked at it because I was in a situation um, where I was working where the soils were limiting. We knew they were limiting uh, because they were highly organic and low in mineral matter, so low in elemental silicon. And we saw benefits uh, immediately. It was vis You could visually walk out into a field and see the difference between a plant amended with and without and how it was affecting plant disease. Well, if you take a country like Brazil, for an example, uh, those, those, those soils are what they call oxisols or ultisols. Those are known to be highly weathered soils, which means they're low pHs, low base saturations, uh, they're high in aluminum, low in elemental silicon. You know, Brazil, it may be 60% of the land area are those kind of soils. And they're growing a lot of agronomic crops like sugarcane and rice that have been proven to be very beneficial. And so, you know, these growers are using it because, you know, they've been shown that they can benefit from it and they are benefited from it. And then they're doing further research in, in a lot of other, you know, plant 
species, you know, from tree fruits to vegetables. Same thing in, in uh, southern Africa and, and parts of Asia. Those soils are the same kind of soils. They're just highly weathered soil to the southern hemisphere. In the uh, Americas, we have Ulta soils in the southeastern part of the United States. Um, we have some or pockets of organic soils, or histo soils, like in Florida and Michigan, and I forget where else. Uh, they have what they call these sandy intosols. So sand, even though it's silicon dioxide, SiO2, I mean, it doesn't weather. That's why you have beaches, right? And so it's not supplying enough soluble silicon to the plant. It's highly uh, insoluble in water. And so there are, there are areas where uh, there could be a benefit, and I think there's research that's going on now looking at a lot of different Midwestern soils. I think soils in New Jersey were in the past, they were considered to be probably high, but it's not supplying a, a sufficient amount of silicon, and they're showing the benefits of actually applying something like a calcium silicate to supply silicon to the plant and getting a benefit.